Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in a minute or two. Yeah, there's just a lot of people joining, so we're going to give people a couple minutes here. Can you um, leave her? So everyone should see a slide on the screen right now. I just got a thumbs up from a couple of people if you can see the, it must be perfect, okay. Cool. <laughs> so, I just wanna make sure that I can also see. So we don't want to see anything there? I don't know, I'm trying to figure it out. Okay. Um, so welcome everybody to our September webinar. We are the WBUR Biz Lab, and we're going to give you a quick introduction to us and kind of our work before we hand it over to the wonderful three speakers that we have this afternoon. But really quickly, we want to welcome all of you because there are 59 unique organizations here across 23 states and three countries, and we're super excited that all of you are here. Uh, most of them are from public media, about 52%. Uh, a lot are also from nonprofit news, about 35%. And then we also have a mix of a bunch of other people in the room with us, which are uh, anyone from professors to freelancers to other types of journalists at different types of organizations. So we're really excited to see this many people interested in this kind of work. So welcome to all of you. And I'm going to hand it over to Joan D'Amico, who's our executive director. And she's going to talk a little bit about uh, BizLab and what we do just briefly. Hey everybody, um, so welcome. We're thrilled that this the news of this webinar spread beyond just our um, community of public radio. So WBUR is Boston's NPR news station and within WBUR, we are BizLab. You can see the whole team right here. Um, we're a small team running um, outside the core of the station where our specific mission is to um, our specific mission is to test ideas for new revenue. And so as part of that, we convene people in this webinar series to share information and to share best case studies specifically around revenue. Um, right. um, okay, so what we're doing, so how we're doing that this year is that in 2019, this whole year, we've been working with seven different radio stations across the country. And this is um, thanks to funding from CPB and the Knight Foundation. So we're working with stations for over a six month period. Um, you can see the list of them on the screen, DC, Louisville, Sacramento, Vermont, Detroit, and Miami. Um, and with each of them, what we're doing is a six month period where we take an idea and we test it in market to see if it has legs. Um, we follow the process of design thinking, which you probably are familiar with. Um, but basically what we do is we go from the original idea of, a, of, a, of an idea for revenue, a problem statement, and then we do some user research where we talk to an audience, then we develop a hypothesis of what we believe as a product will work, and then we experiment so that we can figure out what, what is best out in the market. So that's kind of the overview of what we're all busy doing um, five days a week. Um, if you're curious to learn more, we're, having a, we're hosting a summit um, at December 10th here in Boston at WBUR. Um, all of the stations are going to be presenting their projects, which we're thrilled about. And we're also going to have a lot of discussion around how do you innovate and test and um, launch new products within public media. So if you'd like to find out more, um, stay in touch. And so we have been doing webinars uh, all year long since we have started working with our seven stations in March. We've done, uh, it's about one webinar every other month at this point. Uh, they are usually around a different topic every time. We've covered the topics of podcast donations. We've had all three of the IST sites, so DCist, um, LAist, and Gothamist uh, present with us as well. They're always about revenue generation, usually with detailed case studies sharing exactly what works. They're typically on the fourth Tuesday of every month. And you can find out about the next ones that we're doing uh, by heading to our website and joining our mailing list or publicradiobizlab.org, or you can follow us on Twitter at WBURBizLab. 
For logistics of today's webinar, so obviously we're in a Zoom meeting, everyone's muted by default on entry into the room. You can ask questions to any of the presenters, but we ask that you do it in the chat window below. And Lindsay Goldberg, that's me, I'm the program manager at the Biz Lab. We will uh, facilitate asking questions to all three of the presenters once everybody's finished speaking. So uh, type in your questions as you have them. You don't have to wait until the end of all three to ask the questions, but we just won't have the conversation about the actual questions until everybody's done speaking to keep things running as smoothly as possible. But please ask. We definitely want you to do that, and we will uh, make sure to have time at the end for questions as well. Today's topic, as most of you know, is bridging the gap between audience engagement and revenue generation with technology. And we are super excited to have representatives from GroundSource, Harkin, and News Revenue Hub all together in the same little Zoom room. Um, so we have Andrew, who is the founder and CEO of GroundSource, Meredith, who's the engagement strategy and industry partnerships lead at Harkin, and Rebecca, who's the director of data and strategy at News Revenue Hub. And now we are going to hand it off to them. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Meredith from Harkin is actually gonna go first. So Meredith, take it away. Can everyone hear me? Just a quick test. Okay, great. Um, share my screen. Great, so I'm Meredith Turk from Harkin. Um, actually, I'm just gonna minimize this real quick. Sorry. Great, I'm Meredith Turk from Harkin. And um, for those of you who don't know what Harkin is, uh, we've been around for about four years and we are an engagement strategy company. Um, we have some bespoke technology that we've built out that newsrooms all over the world are using. We, we also consult on engagement strategy across um, many different topics at newsrooms. So I'll get a little bit into that. Um, so Harkin was founded really from looking at the traditional journalism story cycle of um, the difference in engagement between the public and the newsroom. It used to be that newsrooms um, are really engaged in developing a story and then fell off once it was published and then the public was actually doing the opposite they weren't engaged in the story creation and they got really excited around comments and wanting to be engaged once the story was published um, so what we've done is really thought through different ways to interrupt that process and so the technology that we have created um, really allows newsrooms to ask questions of the, or have audience members ask questions that um, the newsroom can take and um, explore together. We have uh, built a, a platform that audiences can vote on topics, um, and then ways that these stories can be shared easier. And then we also have a way for um, newsrooms to build in follow-up questions. So that has created this different model where the newsroom and the public are working on stories together and the newsroom is really soliciting questions from the audience. So I'll show you what that looks like. It's down here, it's a little small. For those of you who don't use Harkin, um, what we've done is created, um, our technology is called an engagement management system. And so, people ask, how is this different from a Google form? And you know, what we do is we're really creating this outward facing embed. Down here it says local wonder. And that is really a place for your audience to say, this is what I'm curious about. Here's my name, here's my email, keep me up to date. And then all of that information goes into the engagement management system. So the newsroom can plug in and see who's asking what types of questions on what topics, where are they from, um, and really start to manage across a newsroom how questions are coming in. So that's a little bit about our technology. Um, and I'll just explain that briefly because we have a lot to get to, but um, this is just a great quote that um, the Harkin platform keeps the entire process organized, running smoothly and looking good. So that allows different reporters to hop in and out and see who the audience is at any point in time. So one big topic and just like general motto that we have at Harkin is that when you optimize for relationships and trust that value follows. So what we're going to talk about today is really how do we build relationships and trust and then 
what kind of value do we see? And that is, you know, monetary value for newsrooms, but it's also um, value for reporters and the public. So there's a lot of reasons that um, practicing engagement is really hard in newsrooms. Uh, there's limited resource time, there's logistical challenges. Um, this here about leadership doesn't connect with ROI. We find that, you know, a lot of newsroom leadership is wondering, this seems kind of like fluffy work, that it's not gonna connect to, um, to money generation, but what we're starting to see is that it really is connecting. Um, and so in order to do this, we really emphasize that this is not going to be one project that's going to change the newsroom. This is not going to be one person, but it's going to require an entirely new mindset shift in the way that newsrooms work. And these are the three pillars that we promote with our work that if you don't do all of these together, you're going to really miss out on what it means to have uh, really a value proposition in your work. So that's content, that's data and insights, and that's deep audience engagement. And so the value that comes from all of that work are in three tiers. Um, for reporters, when they start creating original relevant content, they feel more motivated to do their work. They feel a general job satisfaction that is uh, is pretty transformational. Um, I know a lot of reporters, I myself have spent a lot of time working on stories that um, just haven't haven't done well. And so that now we're really in, informing the work um, for reporters from what the audience really is asking for. Um, and then from the organizational level, um, we're starting to be able to say, this is how many people are really engaged in this content. This is how many people are asking for newsletter signups around this particular series or idea and able to sell sponsorship ads, able to sell um, t-shirts, able to sell, um, you know, uh, event tickets. There's a, there's a lot there that's, that's cropping up based on these series that we're, we're helping newsrooms create. Um, and then the audiences, they're feeling more valued and heard um, as we build this feedback loop of talking to audiences and soliciting their questions. So I love this slide, it's really busy, but I bring it up because it, it really illustrates how much of this type of work is a process. Um, so at the top you have public, um, and so these are how all of these different areas can be transformed by really using this model. So you have the public aspect, you have the marketing aspect, you have your editorial aspect, and you have your business aspect. So when your public um, is asking questions and voting on the questions they want to be heard, they're crowdsourcing information, and they're asking follow-up questions, they start to feel a loyalty to the organization. Um, and that can be tracked based on our engagement management system, you can start to see how many people are engaging with that content. Um, and then from a marketing standpoint at an organization, it's a great opportunity to create a new brand, um, to help spread the word about what the newsroom is doing, um, and really start to grow an audience that is different than the one that you've always had. And from the editorial side, it seems pretty clear. Um, the more questions you're getting in from your audience, the richer the information and the more relevant that information is as we are um, you know, in service to the public. And then from the business standpoint, this is what everyone's curious about. How do, how do you take those emails? How do you take that demographic information and then convert that to Money for the organization. And so that's really what we're doing in the second and third year iterations of some of the newsrooms we're working with is saying, here's all this bulk of information that you're getting from this engagement management system that you can then go to sponsors and say, um, this is how many people are interacting with our content. This is how many people are submitting questions. Um, we can sell sponsorship space for this um, or for a podcast about this topic. So here's just a few points. There's many other uh, data points that we have about how Harkin is you know, affecting newsrooms.
but one is we have a really easy way for you to opt into newsletters in the embed that, that organizations use. And we find that more than 50% of people when given the option to sign up for a newsletter do. So um, there's a curiosity and there's an interest and there's sort of like a growing loyalty of your audience that wants to, to be kept in the loop around these series. Um, and we also found this was a couple years ago, but a study was done about um, newsrooms that use Harkin and they found that there was two to five times more likely conversion from Harkin users to become members of the organization, so to donate. Um, and that was, you know, an increase of, of what it was before. So we're finding actually more and more, I, I want the study to be done again, because I think we're finding that even more and more as the years go by that newsrooms are seeing that higher conversion rate. Um, so I, I love this one. Um, the, one of the first, um, the first Harkin project came out of WBEZ. Um, and the project is called Curious City. And in, uh, they have a podcast around this topic. And every year they sell $100,000 in sponsorship for that series. And so that's, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of potential to hire people um, for a newsroom. And when we're hearing more and more that there's resources that are strapped in newsrooms, that's, you can, a newsroom can do a lot with that. I'm sure everyone on here could make use of that type of money. And that's all just being sold to, um, to as underwriting and sponsorship on that podcast. And that money goes back into the organization to keep doing this kind of work. Um, Vermont Public Radio is a, a great other example. They have a monthly podcast around this topic. Um, where they ask audience questions and then they vote monthly on those questions and then they report about those questions. And they have been able to um, get 10% of their total pledge drive yield from this project. Um, they, I know that they sold out a t-shirt series. Um, they created this sweet little logo up here on the right and they frequently sell out podcast underwriting spots. And they've been around for a couple of years doing this work. So it didn't happen overnight, but their commitment to asking audience, to getting audience feedback and questions has really paid off for them. Um, so I, this, this slide here I really love because this goes to really show what it takes to change culture at an organization, um, KPCC in LA did a really um, a cool thing with their reporters. Um, they didn't have just one engagement person working on this, but they actually required that every reporter build out a mission statement. So you can see up here on the right, um, this reporter has their mission statement up here. I explore how Southern Californians are trying to overcome the stigma of mental health struggles and what it will take to make, what it will take to make help more accessible. And so Alyssa's, Mission statement is tied into our um, Harkin embed, so people can submit questions around that. And they start to really see that Alyssa is a person, is um, you know loyal to her work, so that loyalty is illustrated. And so every reporter has that. And so that is a way to start really um, changing the culture at a newsroom. They also require that 10% of the work that the reporters do has an engagement strategy to it. Um, and so that's Harkin based or there's, there's another uh, number of organizations where they could use that um, sort of engagement work. So I love this example because I think it really illustrates um, like what it requires at a newsroom to really transform culture. Um, I'll end here, but engagement is a process, not a product. Uh, there's not going to be one series that's just going to fix it in a month. It's going to be um, months of dedicated work um, and years of commitment to slowly growing new audiences and connecting with your audiences in different ways. But what we have seen is more and more once that is done over a period of time that the, the money and the revenue comes. So, I'll stop there and we'll take questions after.
Thank you, Meredith. Sorry, I just want to make sure I'm unmuted. Okay, great. So uh, for those of you who joined us a little bit late, we are saving all questions until the end, but please throw them in the chat box down below and we will make sure that all of your questions get asked. Just uh, we want to wait until after everyone has finished their presentation. So without further ado, Andrew, if you want to share your screen, you're good to go. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen here. Um, all right, can you see this? Thumbs up, anyone? Great. Uh, so I'm Andrew Haig, founder of Ground Source. Uh, prior to Ground Source, I was a reporter at Minnesota Public Radio, then co-founded the Public Insight Network. So I've really been working at the intersection of public media and media and engagement for, gosh, 16 years now. So, um, uh, and really Ground Source is the latest iteration of that work and the challenge that we set out to solve and we're setting out to solve with Ground Source is a really big one that media in general, we feel like need to move out of the broadcast era where we're lecturing or speaking to a passive audience and into the relationship age. Um, and that challenge has a lot of different moving parts to it and, and uh, Harkin is attacking a part of that, News Revenue have another part of it, but I feel like there's increasingly a tribe of people and a group of platforms that are that media organizations can use to build a relationship with their audience, a genuine two-way relationship. Uh, and really it's about kind of earning and keeping the attention of our audience and, and building loyalty. And that, that requires a lot more than just feeding a feed. Um, we, the average person scrolls through more than 300 feet of news feeds a day. And in that context, earning and keeping and holding the loyalty of our audience is, is really challenging. Um, so uh, the problem, uh, kind of, as, as I was getting to, is that the, the 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 models that are optimized for clicks and eyeballs are broken, um, and that we need more inclusive, authentic, and two-way methods for engaging with our communities that meets them where where they are on the technologies they're using in the spaces where they feel comfortable communicating, uh, and and what's needed are a service or services that help media and brands build loyalty through sustained two-way connections, and that's really what Ground Source is all about. Because we believe that funnels don't build loyalty, that loyalty isn't a product of trying to sell something uh, sell something to someone. It's about building a relationship over time. That loyalty is a relational challenge, uh, not a transactional one. Um, and you'll see different versions of this. I think in Rebecca's presentation, I think they have an escalator. I think Harkin talks about a cycle. Uh, you know, we, we talk about this this um, the spiral almost of an engagement over time, building loyalty that can take different forms from high attention and high participation to people just wanting to kind of sit back and take in information and not participate. That relationship, like any good relationship, it takes a lot of different forms. And really that's what Ground Source is enabling the ability to, to stay in touch with a large group of people over time and then to when appropriate, asking them for input and feedback and stories and all that kind of thing. Um, so what we built is we think like to think of it as kind of a MailChimp for mobile, uh, but a way to build automated two-way conversations that have skip logic and branching, uh, and then to trigger those conversations using keywords by texting a keyword into a phone number, and then for you to be able to monitor feed of all the responses, interact with people on a one-to-one -one basis, or to build lists of people and segment them and to kind of build smaller groups of people to text back and forth with. Um, and really, it's just the, the kind of overall business imperative of our time really is, is figuring out strategies and helping media organizations develop strategies to engage and grow and, and ultimately, you know, build financial sustainability around their most valuable customers, their fans, and the communities that are most loyal to them. Um, and it happens to, to be that text messaging is really purpose built for, for a lot of these challenges of loyalty and relationship building because of its incredibly high open rates, incredibly high engagement rates. Uh, increasingly, we want to be able to text back with organizations that we feel loyal to or we feel some affinity for, and that texting really is the number one form of communication globally. If you wrap, if you wrap in WhatsApp, some version of text messaging is how uh, most people want to communicate anyway, and we need to be present in that space. Um, right now, we're working with about 40 plus media customers, or sorry, customers. A lot of those are in public media, and here are a few examples of, of our of our clients. Sold in America is a podcast that used us to uh, to engage audiences and to share content during the podcast with audiences. And through that, actually, the number is to 20,000 now. They've built a texting list of 20,000 people. And when they 
they went out to that group uh, at the end of the, the podcast series and asked for input, um, they were able to build two entire bonus episodes from that content. Um, and that included voice memos, text, pictures, a whole range of things. Texas, Texas Tribune used this us at their annual trip fest and it used this for other projects. Science Friday, I see Jennifer and Christian are on the call right now. They've used us for a number of initiatives and built uh, really effective kind of texting clubs around topics. Uh, or, or projects. Minnesota Public Radio, 7,000 people now wake up to text messages every morning with the weather forecast. And, and when, uh, when they're asked for questions or feedback, they respond in kind. And 1A has a texting club of more than 10,000 people who they go out to multiple times a week um, for input on you know, that some, some show that week, whether it's their questions or suggestions for future shows. Uh, and it's really how they take the pulse of that community. Uh, and to Rupert Allman, who's the executive producer of 1A, it's not just about sending stuff out. Uh, it's not just about distribution. It's about um, really adding thousands of people, of uh, voices to their editorial discussion so that they can make better decisions about what topics they're covering. And they know that, so they know that what they're doing is resonating and what's resonating and what's not. Not to mention getting questions for their, for their guests. Um, and Science Friday, uh, they used it for their very popular uh, cephalopod week. Um, and they had a goal of reaching about 500 people through texting and ultimately 800 people signed up and stayed super engaged the course, uh, throughout the course of, of Ceph week. Uh, they've used it for other projects too. Um, and you can see here an example of the text that people have received during Ceph week, including my kids who just love to kind of navigate through this and learn more about the crack and are the great the great squid or the giant squid or other or other kinds of cephalopods. Um, so again, really, really high engagement rates and and you know exceeded their expectations in terms of how many people engaged and how engaged they were during that week. Um, as I said, Sold in America used it to build two entire bonus episodes. Uh, you can have people text in voice memos as well as text. They sent out pictures to people and actually short videos that complemented the content in the podcast. And Stitcher, that which produced Sold in America, is, uh, we're going to be working with them on a on a true kind tr true crime podcast here in the coming months. So we hope to do more work in the podcast area. The Seattle Times uh, has used it to build a texting club around these orca whales that have taken up residence off the coast of Seattle. Uh, they built a texting club of I think now more than 1,500 people who get updates from their environmental reporter uh, when there's uh, when the orcas are present in the Puget Sound or to send updates about their health. And then people text back all kinds of questions and even poems and pictures and all kinds of stuff back to their environmental reporters. So just, and they have about a 94% retention rate over the course of seven or eight months of, of text messaging with this group of people. So really high retention rate, incredibly high engagement rates. Um, and then it's, you know, it's, it's about building this direct connection between this reporter and this community. And in the process, turning all these people from, you know, kind of casual readers to really you know, brand ambassadors or evangelists about the Seattle Times coverage. Um, so there's a lot of ways to use ground source, uh, you know, including texting clubs, interactive news alerts. So it doesn't always have to be about asking questions or collecting information or listening, although that's kind of uh, where our values are. You can use it to send push alerts or texting or text news alerts. Uh, for outreach into communities where we haven't had traditionally had uh, a strong, um, strong relationship, it's a very low barrier way into the conversation with the organization for crowdsourcing for stories, really effective for using at events uh, like Unheard LA, which KPCC uses ground source to engage people during the event and then to keep them involved and engaged after the event. Uh, and then coming soon, some of the things we're really, we're really excited to work on are, you know, communications and kind of customer care for members, paid texting products, um, and push alerts, interactive push alerts, amongst other things uh, are kind of in our R&D lab at the moment. Uh, and on our roadmap, and this gets to the point of this whole you know, series of webinars, is we need to close the gap or close, you know, connect the dots between these really, really high levels of engagement and the depth of engagement you can get through text messaging and the dollar signs. So some of the things we're gonna be working on is remo removing the friction from giving, uh, in this, you know, including integrating with Stripe, but also in the future Venmo, Google Pay, and you name it. Uh, like I said, it's some paid texting products we think are a really smart idea. We're going to start working on some of those. Um, tying through our API into Salesforce, Razor Edge, Allegiance, whatever donor CRM you use, the ability to connect texting to that, um, to that uh, CRM so that you can segment and super engage 
certain uh, cohorts or certain segments of your uh, of your audience or of your of your donor list. Uh, and right now we're working with a small cohort on R&D with some of these loyalty offerings, including Science Friday, KPCC, and KOSU, amongst a few others. So we're keeping that group a little tight for the moment while we get some kind of get some feedback and try to figure out what we need to be building. Uh, but then once we have more data and more of an understanding of how that ties into text messaging, how we can replicate it, other stations will be opening up that cohort. You know, we are open for business in terms of any public media organization wants to use our platform now can use it and we're ready to onboard you. Um, what I'm talking about here is a more kind of uh, a deeper loyalty offering. So that's ground source. Uh, we'd love to take questions at the end of this and um, uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to share this with you. Thank you so much, Andrew. That's awesome. Rebecca, it's all you. Yeah, give me, can you guys hear me? Great. Love the thumbs up. Thank you. Let's share my screen. All right, and I'm just, can I get one more thumbs up if you can see this? Great, thanks. So um, I'm gonna dive right in. I'm Rebecca Quarles. I actually forgot to communicate to Lindsay my new title, but I'm the Senior Director of Membership for the News Revenue Hub. I'm helping to head up our client services team here. I come to the hub by way of the Texas Tribune where I was the membership and marketing manager. And before that, I was at the Times Picayune in my home state of Louisiana, where I helped reporters um, transition to digital first journalism and use social media and community management to enhance their reporting and sourcing. A little bit about the hub. Um, as a nonprofit ourselves, our mission is to help sustain small and medium-sized news organizations around the country by working with them to develop manage and grow sustaining membership programs. Since, since launching in 2016, um, we've helped clients collectively raise a little more than $16 million. Breaking that out, that's a little over $14 million in dollars in the door and a little over $2 million in open monthly and yearly recurring pledges. I'm showing you a list of our current clients because I wanted you to get a sense of not only who's participating in the hub cohort, but who all is participating in this big, this big experiment that is sustainability of public service journalism, like you guys. Um, the hub's growing, and with it, the sophistication of our database, our technology, and resulting benchmarks. So on the topic of loyalty, I'm so glad that, that we're talking about our most engaged audiences today because at the Hub, we really have found them to be the key to success when it comes to reader revenue. It drives everything we do. Um, I'm gonna just pull out a few stats to illustrate what I mean. Whenever a new news organization is accepted into the Hub, the first thing we do is conduct an audience survey. One of the most important, if somewhat simplistic questions in our survey is the net promoter score question. I'm sure you guys have seen this before. A standard NPS question goes something like, how likely is it that you'd recommend this newsroom to a friend or a colleague? So to be honest, when we started, we were a little skeptical that this kind of traditional marketing metric would translate to meaningful insight for news consumers. But we found it to be one of the more accurate predictors of whether an audience is ready to give or whether we need to work with the client more on audience build and loyalty building and being more transparent about the business model. I just wanted to show you, these are the sort of net promoter score stats we're seeing across the cohort so far. It's a minimum score of one, a maximum score of 59, and an average of 39. And why that's important is whenever I'm looking at, uh, when we go to launch a, a, a newsroom's membership program or, pre or promote sort of the membership program 2.0 under the hub's sort of, um, oversight, we're seeing that organizations with, score, with higher scores tend to do better. Um, cultivating loyalty and essentialness are table stakes for newsrooms that want to raise funds from their readers. Those that do this well seem to have higher NPS scores. And I'm seeing that not only when we um, take on a new client, but whenever we go to execute this survey again with them every 12 months. So there's this interesting break at the score of 40 where organizations with a lower score than that uh, or organizations with a higher score than that tend to make three times more money on average than their lower performing peers. It just means that we're constantly trying to look at 
an audience is pr propensity to give and their emotional connection to a news outlet. And it's something to keep in mind. So at the Hub, we harp on newsletters for good reason. Um, and I'm sure, as you guys know, they're very much in vogue right now. But in studying the raw performance data of the Hub's 40 plus newsroom clients, it reinforces that web traffic isn't really tied to membership revenue. Average monthly site users don't pattern in a meaningful way with membership donations. Instead, revenue is largely predicted by how effective a newsroom is at moving site readers onto its email list and getting them to engage with their newsletters once they do. So without, but also keep in mind, like audience size, loyalty matters more than list size. Without lo good list maintenance, a large list doesn't represent a large number of actual readers. There's a stronger association between your count of engaged email subscribers and member revenue than there is between your total amount of email subscribers and member revenue. So in other words, you don't just want more email subscribers, you want more subscribers that engage with your newsletters. Those are the ones we think we have the best chance at converting to paying members. And for us, when we're talking about engaged email subscribers, we roughly define that by using MailChimp's star rating system. Um, star ratings determined by the frequency in which users open and click your emails. Uh, MailChimp will take into account uh, how many different emails a subscriber is subscribed to. And since email accounts for more conversions to membership than site and social combined, across, that's across the cohort, including our audio first clients, um, the most fundamental funnel or reader journey that we look at with clients is web user to email subscriber and email subscriber to donor. I'll elaborate more on that later. But we've set the table when it comes to audience engagement and reader revenue. Let's talk about the Hub's text specifically. Here's how it works. Um, our text triggered based on the action a reader takes on your site. If you give, you're automatically put into Salesforce, and this is synced with MailChimp. If you sign up for a newsletter, you're inserted into MailChimp and then automatically synced to, to Salesforce. We've designed custom connectors between MailChimp, Stripe, and Salesforce specifically with the news industry in mind. That Salesforce MailChimp connector is particularly valuable because it allows you to send sophisticated messaging to your constituents based on their relationship to the organization. I'm gonna show you a few examples. First, this is um, an example of some H conditional HTML that we can add to each, that we do add to each client's flagship newsletters. Um, you'll see this is an example from Voice of San Diego's weekly newsletter. At the top of it, there's a membership call to action that's displayed to um, subscribers on your list that aren't donors. And it's encouraging them to help, help fund the newsletter that they're reading. Whereas this same box for people that are current donors will see a stewardship message thanking them for powering newsletters like this one. And that sophisticated mes messaging extends to each client's automations. You all are probably aware of what a welcome series is, but just so we're on the same page, it's a series of explanatory emails sent to all new subscribers. It should ensure that they know what the newsletter is about, what your newsroom's mission is, what your business model looks like. It can contain links to donate, but they should be minimal. Instead, it should really just help prime readers for giving. Um, once, new, once all new subscribers complete that welcome series, non-donors are moved into an appeal series. The emails in that series help to make a concerted case for your nonprofit mission and explicitly ask for contributions. In essence, the tech allows you to have a permanent member recruitment campaign running in the background so that you can focus on what you do best, which is producing high quality journalism. Um, another automation that we help all clients execute is having a um, member renewal series. So again, the Salesforce MailChimp connector makes it to where MailChimp powers the, MailChimp fires the series, but it's powered by a donor's membership expiration date in Salesforce. And because um, as soon as a donor renews based on their response to the series, um, that's automatically updated in their account so that they're removed from the aut automation even if they haven't completed the series. That way we don't keep hitting them up to renew after they've already given. The tech also allows you to ask often. We found success by diversifying how each newsroom gets to its revenue goal each year beyond biannual pledge drives. The more agile we can be in your major news moments, those moments when your brand or editorial work is being celebrated, the better. 
think sending a crowdfund campaign to bolster your 2020 elections coverage or to cover public records requests or legal fees related to FOIA. Um, moreover, the more that these appeals are tied to the core product, the better. We just, we always tell newsrooms, don't make membership an island. Let's tie it to the wonderful things you're already doing. The, the tech also allows you to easily send stewardship communications to current donors, reinforcing their status and making them feel a greater sense of co connectivity to the newsroom, um, which again can make it, a lot, make it a lot easier to, when you go to ask them to renew, um, that they will. And finally, the custom tech allows us to run small iterative tests with clients that allow them to optimize their email marketing over time. Most email service providers have a built-in A-B testing functionality. We're just able to use custom Salesforce campaign IDs so that we can look at how much actual money comes in the door based on each variation versus letting MailChimp determine the winner. This is an example from Berkeley side spring camp campaign where we tested content length and the shorter version saw double the amount of donors. And as I was saying earlier, the custom tech allows us to do advanced reporting and donations management in Salesforce. And so I just wanted to elaborate on that for a moment. Um, our collaborations with dozens of news organizations makes us qualified to analyze everyone's performance data, experiment together and learn and share. So having a standardized Salesforce infrastructure across 40 plus newsrooms has allowed us to develop these key performance indicator reports that you see and a benchmarking system. I send these reports to each client once a month and try to help them use data to influence strategy. I collaborate with them to execute on those strategies. So it's a, a lot, it's about a lot more than providing a report. It's about cultivate, cultivating big wins together. And here are the hub's initial performance benchmarks. Again, this is, we're able to do this um, by virtue of the, that, that standard Salesforce infrastructure. We push our clients to pay attention to metrics that move the needle for membership, which is why we're focused on tracking individual donor count and recurring member growth, email list growth, ratio of site users to email subscribers or your acquisition rate, and the ratio of email subscribers to donors or your conversion rate and of course, donor retention. Keep in mind but that what you're looking at here is solely um, looking at donors and donations below $5,000. Our tech is meant to help you convert everyday readers into paying members. Donations above 5K usually involve a different type of fundraising work. And so we exclude them from a lot of the reporting that we do. So by virtue of all of us being here today, I think we can agree that rising tides lift all boats. We're committed to sharing out our findings with the news industry at large. You can always follow along if you're interested by signing up at fundjournalism.org slash newsletter. I think y'all Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, now let's kick it off with that one question. Yeah, so yeah, it's Q&A time. So we're gonna start with a question from us and then we will get to all of the questions below that you guys have been asking the whole time. So thank you again to the three of our presenters. We appreciate you all and we would clap for you if we weren't on Zoom because it's a little bit weird, but we're clapping in our heads and right here with our team, so go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, thanks everybody. I, I really, um, I feel like there are a lot of questions people haven't asked, so put them in the chat because the questions can be, I feel like, fairly detailed and technical or more high level. So to kick it off, um, one question we wanted to ask the three of you is, should a newsroom buy all three of your tools? <laughs> um, and, you know, oftentimes a newsroom is it has limited resources, so how do you differentiate your three tools? Do they work together? Um, how do you think about the purchase process between the three of you? Which may or may not be an awkward question because you might be in competitive situations. <laughs> um, I, no, I don't think it's competitive. I think that you can see that these, um, like I said, we're all sort of in partnership with one another. And that I think that Meredith and Andrew, you'd both agree, we're not just a SaaS company or an out of the box tool. Um, organizations have to apply to the hub to be considered for the cohort. Um, we're very collaborative. So once you join, you've got to be willing to share your findings and best practices with other hub members. 
And, and so it's really, it's the, the text sort of just the starting off point. If, if we don't think you're going to harness it for the, for, to the best of your ability or, or being like, be a, a good player in the hub, then it's, it's more of a ongoing consideration. Yeah, I said this um, when we were first discussing this question, I think any one of these tools or companies can get you started thinking about engagement. And it's really um, a beta test for a project to illustrate to the rest of the newsroom what is possible. Um, and I think any one of these tools can start to illustrate that. Um, and again, to what Rebecca's saying, one thing we do at Harkin is you, we have three different tiers. You can um, use just our technology and none of our consulting hours, or you can use our technology and 10 hours of consulting from our team. And then if you have multiple projects and you really want to develop a new sort of culture at your newsroom, we have 20 hours of consulting and that we will work on a number of different topics, um, newsletters or events or podcasting, um, pretty much anything that you want. And that sort of connection with consulting and the technology is really, I think, essential. And I, I think all of us do that. Um, so it's really just kind of a matter of um, like what specific project you see um, these tools fitting into. Yeah, just building off of that, um, there are newsrooms that use Harkin and GroundSource. There are newsrooms that use News Revenue and Harkin and GroundSource. Um, and I really think it's about building this kind of holistic relationship with your audience and what tools you need to, to and what platforms you need and services you need for different aspects of that relationship. I think the kind of uh, the one point I would be kind of adolescent version of engagement in newsrooms is like, oh, I finally got the budget to do some engagement work and I can only choose one of those engagement things from the engagement shelf. Um, and I think hopefully we're getting beyond that to where we are really trying to think about like, what does that cycle of engagement look like? What are the different touch points? What do these communities need in terms of where are they gathering and where is it best to meet them? Uh, and I think with answers to those questions, then you start to build, you know, then we need these tools for these different things. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, so I think it's, it's um, we are all, as, as Rebecca said, um, you know, rising tide lift all boats, lift all boats, as we all get out there and tell our story better and get more customers and, and start working with them, I think we all build the space for others to work in. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, all three of you. So making our way through the crowd questions, I just want to address um, Heidi Thompson asked, can you point to some Harkin powered projects that are in process right now? And Meredith shared, if you go to weareharkin.com, you can sign up for the Harkin newsletter and they send out examples of Harkin in the wild every few weeks. Uh, Meredith, I don't know if there's anything you want to speak to directly or if you want to extend on that, but yeah, I just linked that in the comment section so you can Great. go directly to that. Um, if you go also to our partner page, we do a lot of case studies. Um, here, I'll link that to, um, we have hundreds of case studies from our partners and that's growing every week. We're always like, another thing, it's, it's actually hard to keep up with all the, the iterations of what um, newsrooms are doing with this technology. So, um, but that's a great place. That's where we've interviewed newsrooms about how they've used their um, used Harkin. So, go to that case study section. It'd be a great place. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to take two questions and kind of combine them into one. So, Joan had asked, uh, "What do you recommend as a first step?" This is for Harkin uh, for a newsroom embarking on this journey to engagement-focused change. And then Gabby um, asked, "What some metrics are to evaluate?" whether or not there's been an actual mindset shift. So what are the first steps toward the mindset shift? And then how do you evaluate a mindset shift that's kind of in progress? And, and this is for me again? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's a tricky one. I know that there's, um, I think there's a Center for Media Engagement study with Gatehouse that's coming out where they did some surveying around mindset shift. Um, it's funny, well, I, I asked my whole team that when I saw that come in and I was like, what do you guys think? And um, I really think the example I showed with KPCC is a great example um, about 
you know, reporters across a newsroom and editors across a newsroom really stepping up and saying, this is how we're going to embody engagement. Um, I know some newsrooms, um, there might be some on here um, that we work with who have requirements around how many stories come out per reporter that are like engagement focused or using that engagement tool. Um, so I know that's like an, a metric that maybe doesn't answer all the questions, but you start to see that it's, it's having, um, you know, sort of salience across the newsroom. Um, and then you wanted me to answer the um, how to get started. Yeah. That, um, so I think I talked a little bit about like the barriers that we find when we go into newsrooms. And I think one of the big barriers we find is just like not everyone's excited. And there's a few people who are like, yes, we're so thrilled to have this new thing. And then everyone else is just you know, worried about what that's going to require. And so I think my best recommendation is to really find that team that's super pumped and excited and start there. And then um, once there's a few examples of how it's working, then you can start to, to make those arguments to the rest of the newsroom. Like, these are the points that are going to convince you. Um, because I, I don't think everyone's on board. And for for legitimate reasons, um, there's a lot of resources that we just, we don't have time to add things to our plate all the time. But I'd say like get a really solid team um, who really wants to work on this. And that's how I always start. Awesome, thank you, Meredith. Um, so we're gonna move to ground source. Cody Fiala from VPR has asked to Andrew, how are the responses to thousands of texts cost effectively resourced within these organizations? So Cody, is that a cost or a management thing? I think it sounds like a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can. So there's the um, response. It's okay. So we started off uh, kind of pretty dogmatically as a listening company, um, you know, very much like Hark in the sense that we felt like a big gap in the in the space and media in general, especially public media, was we weren't listening enough to our audience. Um, but I think what we've evolved to understand and we're growing to understand is that listening um, is hard. And it, you know, uh, if you ask for feedback, you have to be present to um, to read that, read through everything and to the best you can, to the best extent you can respond to it. So, you know, we now work with newsrooms to kind of mix in listening and feedback generation with more, uh, you know, news alerts and, and uh, keeping people, you know, um, keeping in touch with people about, you know, projects or, or different initiatives that your newsroom's working on. And then when appropriate, turning on that feedback, feedback mechanism, which will fill up with, with feedback uh, almost assuredly. So a, a couple things, you know, uh, having, um, dedicating the resources um, and being realistic about the time it takes to really go through everything and read through it and, um, and be able to make sense of it you know, to the extent that you want it, you know, guide programming or inform, uh, inform producers of the direction that the project should take. Um, so that's one thing. And I think in terms of cost, um, I think there was another question about how much these services cost. You know, our clients pay anywhere from $100 a month upwards of many multiples of that, depending really, and we base our pricing on the number of active relationships you have with a, with your, within your community. So, um, the more active relationships you have, the more people you're communicating with on a month to month basis, the more, the more you'd pay, but you can have really effective, high impact projects where you're communicating with a few hundred people if you're in contact with them frequently and you're listening to them. So it's not, and I think this gets to a point that I think it, um, folks at Harkin and I talk about a lot. It's like, sometimes it's not about, you know, we, we have to move out of this idea of like everything we do has to scale to the many, many thousands. Sometimes we can have incredible impact in the community by listening to or paying real close attention to a few dozen people or a few hundred people. And sometimes the most effective convenings are one or which are really engaged small group of people show up. So I think it's, it's really being intentional about who you're trying to listen into and what your, what your intent is in listening to them and engaging them. Uh, and then having the resources available to, to make sure you can back up that promise. But that doesn't have to be like, boy, if we don't get tens of, tens of thousands of people responding to this, it's going to be a failure. We, you know, got to break that kind of scale above all mindset, I think. Great. Thank you, Andrew. 
Um, so I want to jump over to Rebecca really quickly because someone asked if you're only available to small and medium sized newsrooms. Yeah, good question. Um, whenever I said the small to medium sized publishers, I'm talking about that in relation to our mission. That is our mission to help those smaller and medium sized ones achieve greater financial sustainability. We certainly work with larger publishers. It's just they don't really need our help as much when it comes to the sustainability part. So um, no, open to um, we open to all forms of newsrooms. That is an excellent segue into the question of cost for all of these products. Someone asked that in the chat box. I don't know if it's best to try to get in touch with each of you individually when it comes to cost, or if there is a flat number you can give. But all three of you can answer that uh, whichever way you want to right now. Um, for the News Revenue Hub, similar, I think, to what Meredith was saying, we have we have tiers um, of service and uh, the lowest starts at $500, the highest at $2,500 currently, and then have sort of custom packages for clients that are larger than that. Um, yeah, we have our, our largest package is for um, 20 hours of consulting and our technology, um, and that's a little over $12,000. Um, that's for a year. And then um, below that is 10 hours of consulting around, and that's uh, about 8,000. And then just using our technology without any consulting is around 5,000. Um, we also have a membership community that you can join that's um, $150 a year. That's like a low, very low entry way to just keep in touch with how Harkin partners are, are using the tech. And we, do, we bring in like a lot of, um, insights from outside the industry and other industries who are working on community engagement. So I mentioned this earlier, uh, we will, we can start as low as hundred dollars a month, um, even potentially below that, depending on the project and then move upwards from there. And really we spent time with you to understand that the size of the community you want to engage, uh, ideally it's hard to know exactly how many people will show up. Um, and then the cadence and, you know, the kind of impact you want it to have on either your business or your editorial. And then from that, we'll kind of put, put together a proposal um, and kind of put you in the right tier. Great. Thank you, guys. So um, in the interest of time, I'm going to share my screen really quickly to show you one last slide. I just have a couple of last things. Uh, we did not get to all the questions, but if you do still have questions, Meredith has provided her email address in the chat box. It is meredith.turk at weareharkin.com. You're also welcome to reach out to any of us. Um, if you have questions, hopefully you can all see my screen. Oh, yes. Can you yes, also I'd also love to announce the summit we're hosting soon if you have, yes. if you have a minute. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I just popped that into our last slide right here. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter right here at WBUR Biz Lab. Oh, looks I can't like see it for a second. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Hold on. I'm on two screens. You see it now? Yeah. Mm, there we go. Okay. <laughs> so, sorry about that. WBUR Biz Lab, you can follow us on Twitter. You can also reach out to us if you need any more questions answered. I'm happy to facilitate an intro for you if need be, or I can ask uh, myself and get back to you publicradiobizlab.org for updates on our work. You can email us if you have questions about our December 10th summit, and we will have a link for tickets to ours coming out soon. But Harkin is having an Engagement Innovation Summit on October 23rd and 24th in New York City, and you can head to engagementinnovator.com for more info on that. Meredith, you can add anything you have as well. Um, yeah, I just posted the link in here. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, let me know. And um, yeah, we're going to be, it's, it's going to be neat. I think um, we're going to be bringing in people from all different industries to talk about what they, they know about community engagement. Awesome. And then, um, so Andrew just dropped uh, a phone schedule in there as well. Oh, everybody's dropping contact information into the chat box. And I will also send all of this information back out uh, when I send out the recording of this call to our email list, which everybody who registered has been added to our email list. So you will receive all this information. Don't worry about scrambling to write it down. Okay. Thank you so much to our presenters. Thank you guys for coming. This has been wonderful. Thank y'all. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, guys. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Is it um, possible to, sh to